among uh, all the various emperors of the Habsburg dynasty, uh, let's mention Maximilian I, who will start the famous marriage policy. Uh, and as a consequence, marriages would brought, bring uh, territories, uh, new territories, uh, into uh, the hands of the Habsburg. And so, for example, with Maximilian I, uh, in three generations, they uh, the Habsburg managed to expand uh, almost in an explosive way their territories. So Maximilian I will marry in 1477. He marries Mary of Burgundy. We see her on the right side of the portrait. You see that she is looking to heaven. Why? Because uh, at the time this uh, family portrait was painted, she had already died. Uh, but nevertheless, she was painted. So what was the history? Maximilian I marries Mary of Burgundy, who was the last heir of the Duchy of Burgundy, which was a very flourishing, uh, very well-organized country, a flourishing economy, and also very refined uh, on the cultural and artistic level. Um, the, at that time, uh, Burgundy was covering the north of France, uh, actual Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, the southern part of uh, Holland, and also Lorraine and uh, Franche-Comté. So uh, really a very big country and with the huge advantage of having the ports of Antwerpen and Bruges. So uh, the marriage contracts were usually doubled by um, succession contracts. And so as Mary of Burgundy died very young, the Duchy of Burgundy arrived into the hands of the Habsburg. One generation later, Maximilian married his son Philip, you see him here, and his sister Margaret to uh, uh, Juan and Juana of Castilla y Aragon, so shall we say the Spanish royal family, and the uh, again through lucky circumstances, uh, Spain arrived into the hands of the Habsburg, uh, and uh, also with the overseas territories, America had just been discovered a few years before, and the third generation. Uh, Maximilian I married his grandson Ferdinand and his sister Mary to the children of the Jagellon, uh, who were kings of Hungary and Bohemia. And again, through lucky circumstances, the crowns of Bohemia and Hungary arrived into the hands of uh, the Habsburg family. And so uh, it was called the Empire, where the sun never sets, uh, because it was starting uh, in the uh, very east of Eastern Europe. Hungary was much, much bigger than it is now. Uh, you were landing western on the Spanish coast, on the Atlantic Ocean. You were crossing the ocean and, and you still had the overseas ter uh, territories. So also here, just to give you an example of this very famous marriage policy. Then the Ottomans, another aspect of the history of Vienna. Um, in 1529, we have the first siege of Vienna under Suleiman I, and uh, we have here an Ottoman miniature uh, showing uh, the tent of the Sultan on the, uh, the front, and behind, you see, so this is just a detail, you see the city walls of Vienna. And so, even being the enemy, uh, the Viennese were absolutely fascinated by the opulence of uh, the costumes uh, of uh, these uh, Ottomans, of the Janissaries, uh, the beauty of the embroidered tents, etc., etc. And uh, we will see that uh, there will be a second siege. The first siege of uh, 1529 uh, was interrupted by the arrival of winter. So they left on their own. And the second siege in 1683 was interrupted by the arrival uh, of 
the Polish army led by Jan Sobieski. And later, um, the, there will be, shall we say, an Ottoman Oriental heritage in Viennese culture. We will recognize Oriental elements in some architectural details. Uh, we will find Oriental elements in music. Just think of the Turkish march by Mozart or the adduction of the Seraglio. Uh, if we take another composer, you look, uh, you have the pilgrims of Mecca. And so there will be, even having been the uh, enemies, there was this fascination for the Orient. And um, again, an other aspect of history, the religion wars. Uh, so the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. At the end of the Middle Age, uh, a group of people will protest against the commercialization of religion, understand the selling of indulgies, uh, which ironically I call a first-class tickets uh, to paradise, uh, considering that paying a substantial sum of money, uh, you would be absolved from your sins, and the collected money was uh, used to finance the construction of St. Peter in Rome. So you had a commercialization of indulges and of relics. So the people protesting against that were called the Protestants, quite obviously. The movement was called the Reformation. The Protestants, among others, were also against the imagery uh, in the churches. And uh, therefore, in politics or in religion, often both are linked. In this case, they are very uh, uh, narrowly linked. One movement calls a counter-movement, which will be the counter-reformation. Uh, and so the counter-reformation uh, will be characterized by the Baroque uh, artistic movement. I always define the Baroque movement as being the artistic expression of both the triumphing counter-reformation and uh, absolutist power. And uh, we'll see through a few examples, especially architectural examples, uh, how present is the Baroque style in Vienna. So for the amateurs of Baroque architecture, you really, uh, you find all you want in Vienna. Um, then uh, Maria Theresa, has absolutely to be mentioned. Maria Theresia is probably the most important woman in Austrian history. Maria Theresia uh, reigned for 40 years. Uh, she was born in 1717. Uh, she reigned from 1740 to 1780. And at the beginning of her career, she had quite a hard work. Actually, being a girl, she had not been particularly prepared by her father to succeed to him. And being a very clever, she was seeing that there was no little brother coming, and so she prepared herself on her own together with the director of the newly uh, built National Library. And so she started studying uh, history of political institutions, history, genealogy. Genealogy at the time was extremely important to know the genealogy of all the main royal families. And uh, Maria Theresia uh, grew up uh, together with her future husband, uh, who had been prepared uh, to become her husband. Uh, and she always declared, even be, uh, being almost uh, a, a, a small uh, girl, she always declared, it will be him or I shall never marry. So she knew exactly what she wanted. So... Uh, her father, Charles VI, died abruptly uh, in 1740 uh, after having eaten the wrong mushrooms. Uh, and so Maria Theresia succeeded to her father. Her father had just organized a pragmatic sanction, which was a law uh, he organized on purpose, which allowed, in absence of a male heir, a girl to succeed uh, to uh, the titles of uh, Archduchess of Austria and also uh, to the titles of 
Queen of Hungary and Queen of Bohemia. Um, her uh, husband, we see on the left side of this portrait, family portrait, uh, was Francis Stephen of Lorraine, and then she organized the, uh, that he was elected emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. They were, it was a love story. Uh, they loved each other uh, a lot, uh, and they had 16 children. Ten of them reached the adult age, and Maria Theresia was also famous for her own marriage policy. So she did a love marriage. None of her children did. Uh, they were like uh, chess pieces, um, and uh, they were married across Europe, uh, mainly to consolidate uh, alliances or uh, treaties of peace. Uh, only one daughter was allowed to do a love marriage. It was Maria Christina marrying Albert from Saxony. Um, yes, and uh, so in the center of uh, this painting, we see with the red coat, we see Joseph II, the eldest son, who will become later. Uh, he will be crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 1765, and then co-reign with his mother, which was sometimes a little bit difficult, uh, till her own death in 1780.